Well, again, thank you for being here. We want to return to the series that we've been preaching all month, Hope for 2021. And uh, we are in really a three-part of a larger part. We've just titled these three parts, Directions for a Better 2021. And we've just shortened it to Directions. And we've taken these directions from the book of Genesis in chapter 35, verses 1 through 7. And then God said to Jacob, go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had, and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. Then they set out, and the terror of God fell on the towns all around them, so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is, Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. The direction that we're going to be looking at this morning is that we need to resolve to build an altar. Now, I really wanted to change the word resolve, but I wanted it to fit into the three R's we've talked about, you know, Return to Bethel, repent of your idols, and then resolve to build an altar. Chapter 35, verse 7, that we've read to you, there he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. But the attitude that I have about this word resolve is not something that I'm suggesting, oh, you know, Pastor, I, you've got a good idea. I'm going to go home today and write down three things that I think I might get to this year. And I didn't really make many New Year's resolutions, but uh, I, I think maybe that's a good idea. I Instead, I... I want to point your attention to the book of Ezra. In chapter 10, in verses 1 through 4, say this, While Ezra was praying and confessing, weeping, and throwing himself down before the house of God, a large crowd of Israelites, men, women, and children, gathered around him, they, too, wept bitterly. Then Shechaniah, son of Jehiel, one of the descendants of Elam, said to Ezra, We have been unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women from the peoples around us. But in spite of this, there is still hope for Israel. Now let us make a covenant before our God to send away all these women and their children in accordance with the counsel of my Lord and of those who fear the commands of our God. 
let it be done according to the law. Rise up. This matter is in your hands. We will support you, so take courage and do it. When I talk about resolve to build an altar, I hope in your ears and in your mind and in your heart, you'll hear, do it. Don't just think about it. Do it. Build an altar. What kind of an altar do we need to build? Number one, we need to build an altar of salvation. There are some of you that are watching me and listening to me right now. Some of you like to hear some of the things that I say. Some of you go, eh, not so much so. It's time for you to get saved. Christ died for you. Calvary, the cross, is a reminder and a symbol of how much God loves his enemies. You need to get saved. Not tomorrow, not next month, today. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to open the door of your heart. Today is the day for you to repent of your sin. You know, in the book of 1 Corinthians, there's a tremendous passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. Brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of First, importance. Nothing is more important than being saved, being born again, opening your heart to the Lord Jesus, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. In the book of Acts, this same apostle that wrote 1 Corinthians the Apostle Paul was called in to give a defense of his testimony. He did so before Agrippa. And in Acts chapter 26 and verse 28, depending on which translation you read, Agrippa looks at Paul and says, almost you have persuaded me to become a Christian. But I'll hear you again of this matter. Never happened. Why put off today till tomorrow what you can do today? I want to say to you, repent of your sin. That's why Jesus died. God's not angry at you. God loves you. Calvary is a timeless reminder. God so loved the world that he gave 
his one and only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. It's not God that sends you to hell, it's your sin. So repent. Express your faith in the Lord Jesus. Oh, I, I know you're trying to do better. I know you're trying to move away from the habits that are chaining you and hurting you and wounding you and messing up your life. I know it's not Bible, but in the words of Dr. Phil, sometimes I want to say, how's that working for you, trying on your, on your own? How's that working for you? What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Express your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then be baptized. Maybe some in this room said, oh, I, I don't know, I, it's cold in that water over there, I don't know. Well, we've made it a way to get warm. And I want to say to some of you, get baptized. Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Some of you have accepted Christ into your heart. Some of you have repented of your sin, expressed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But you haven't been baptized. Do it. Do it. If you're in this area, go on, the, go on our website, fill out a communication card. I want to be baptized. I want to be baptized, and we'll have a water baptismal service real soon. We probably won't do it in the context of the in-person service, but we will do it right afterwards. <clears throat> Secondly, a second kind of an altar that we need to build is we need to have, we need to build an altar of service. And the first service that I'm going to talk about is community outreach. Now, this is not normal for pastors to do, because normally when pastors talk about, oh, you need to serve, oh, we've got this need, and oh, we've got that need, and oh, we've got another need, and, and don't worry, I'll, I'll get to that. But I wonder how many of you saw the news item, I don't know if it was Thursday or Friday, something like that, late, late in the week. There was a principal who watched kids, be, his elementary students, be driven to school, and he suddenly realized that the vehicle that was driving them to school was their home. Their parents didn't have enough money to pay the rent. And the parents didn't have enough money to give the kids money to, to buy food. This principal took an eight-hour, all-night shift at Walmart and started working. And when he got his paycheck, he started distributing the money to the kids. He didn't keep one dime for himself. He worked all night. And then came back and was the principal. I don't know when the man ever slept. Somehow, one of the major news sources got wind of it and was all over the place. Any of you see that? Any of you see that? Tremendous. Great guy. I don't know that he's a believer. 
Don't know whether he is or isn't. But he just said, I couldn't stand to see my kids, the kids of my school, go without. And I thought, if he can do that, without using the name of the Lord, how much more should we who name the name of Christ, who came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many, how much more could we, should we, be reaching to our community with acts of kindness, acts of service? Who cares whether they agree with you or not? Who cares whether they're part of your ethnos? Who cares whether they live in the kind of house you live in? Oh, I'm so glad Jesus came to die for me. I wasn't part of his ethnos. I didn't have a house like he did. But he came down, didn't even have a place to lay his head, stretched out his hands and hung on a cross. New beginnings, Los Banas, the city of Los Banas, the county of, Los, uh, uh, of Merced, needs community outreach. Not just Bible-thumping outreach, just practical, good help and do so in the name of the Lord. That's what motivates us. Now, now we'll get to the part that preachers normally get to. You didn't think I'd not do that, did you? We need help right here. We're killing our tech people. We're killing our worship team. They're here all the time. Oh, I know some of you think they just plop in here 9.45 on Sunday morning and go boop, boop, and it all just comes out nice. No. I'll tell you, people are here real early. And it's always the same people. We need tech people. Gee, Pastor, I don't know much about this. Learn it. Learn it. Volunteer. Come. We'll train you. Oh, when it comes to tech, I won't, but somebody will. I'm having to learn enough on my own right now. We need worship people. We need some singers. We need instrumentalists. If you hear this wrong, I don't know what to say. I am ecstatic of the people we have, but I don't think it's fair to burn them out, wear them out, etc. There's plenty of work to go around. We need Awana helpers. We need people that will come and participate in, in, in the drive through so that our kids can learn the scriptures. We need Kidland teachers. We need to have a whole bundle of volunteer work days. We got work that men can do, Women can do, even kids can do work. We want this place to be the best that it can be. We need youth sponsors and workers and, and helpers. We need to build an altar of service. Do you want to be taken care of? Take care of somebody. Amen? If you want to be helped, if you want to be taken care of, take care of somebody else. Thirdly, now some of you are going to get ticked off at me with this. 
I know we're in an economic downturn, but we need to build an altar of stewardship. And I want to say, number one, thank you for everybody that has been faithful, that has been generous, that you've given, and God bless you, and God has blessed us, but we need an altar of stewardship. And I'm going to say it again. I don't want your money. God says in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I remember a whole lot of years ago. I, I sat in the driveway of my house. And I was praying and I had gotten a particular notice and I started to pray Lord how am I going to do this the paycheck I get and the paycheck Linda gets put together isn't enough to pay our bills Lord I know you want me to tithe how can I do that? I started to do it. Only by God's grace, I started to do it. And I've never been back at that place since. I've had young couples come to me they went to have their taxes done. And the accountant looked at them and said, how have you done it? How are you up to date on everything? How do you do that on what you make? And those young couples have said, Pastor, God blessed us because we tithed. We put God first. You don't pay your bills and then see if you've got enough money left over. You say, Lord, here's what you gave me. Here's 10% of it. Right off the top. Right off the top. And then somebody asks me, oh, pastor, should we tithe on the, on the net or the gross? If I was in Pittsburgh, I'd say, yuns decide. How much do you want to be blessed? How much do you want to be blessed? Now, well, Pastor, I, I, I just want to be blessed a little, so I'm going to, I'm going to tithe on the net. Well, your problem. See, what I want more than anything else for you is for you to experience the blessing of God. That's what makes you rich. Not always monetarily. Give, and it shall be given unto you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Remember, Jesus was sitting at, quote, the receipt of custom. This one had come in and, no, oh, give this, and this one come in and give this. And Jesus was asked the question, Master, who gave the most? He said, see that little lady there? All she had was a half a penny. She gave more than anybody else because she gave everything that she had. You know, a lot of us that like sports are very familiar with the phrase, I left it all on the field. 
I left it all on the mat. I left it all on the court. Whatever sport you want, I didn't hold anything back. I gave it all. There wasn't any more to give. Are you investing your time, your talent, and your treasure? Are you investing it where moth and rust don't corrupt and where thieves don't break through and steal and Wall Street doesn't cut your feet out from underneath you? That's where my treasure is. Let's build an altar to stewardship. And finally, we need to build an altar of soul winning. The Bible says, whoever wins souls is wise. In Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, he says that we are two things to this world. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. The church needs to be salt and light. The church, this building is not the church. Yuns are. Okay? I am. We are. Watching me, if you're a believer, you are the church. One thing about being the light of the world, light attracts. Light attracts. If you will let Jesus live big in you, you will be attractive to people. You won't be sour. You will be attractive. You are the light of the world. We, when I was a kid, we, of course, we had then what we don't have now. We had Sunday night church. Very few places ever have Sunday night church anymore. I'm not saying we should. Please don't get that idea. But part of Sunday night church was testimony meeting. And invariably, one of the older saints, and we all know, knew who it was going to be, she would stand up and say, oh, uh, Oh, I've had this trouble, and I've had that trouble, and I've had this difficulty, and I got my lumbago, and, and oh, my, my kids are rah, 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 lament. And then she would always end the testimony. But if you kids will pray, God will give you what I got. I didn't want what she had. catch a lot more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. Light attracts. Are we shedding the kindness of God to our neighbors, to our neighborhood, to our city, to our county? Or are we thought to be vinegar? Secondly, we are the salt of the earth. You know what one of the characteristics of salt is? It makes you thirsty. It makes you thirsty. It also 
makes the food more flavorable. And also, it preserves. Now, I want to be very careful about this. And I want to say it with, with compassion and kindness. We're in trouble in our country because there's not very much love going around. There's an awful lot of hate going around. We need to be salt and light. The salvation and preservation of our nation will not come from a party, a candidate, a politician, a person. The only thing that will make America what God wants it to be is the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've said it before and I say it again. We renounce all the violence of all extremism. Whether it's the violence on the right and the evil of threatening to kill AOC or whether it's the evil and violence on the left that screams out Hang Mike Pence. We renounce it all. It is godless. It is evil. But we counteract it not with more evil. We counteract it with the love and the light of the Lord Jesus Christ by being salt and light. We serve. We find a need and meet it. Can I ask you who you're taking with you to heaven? Who? Don't answer out loud. Don't, you know. In heaven, who's going to come up to you and say thank you for giving to the Lord? How many are you going to take with you? Either because you won them to the Lord personally or you introduced them to your church and they got saved or you gave so a missionary could go to a foreign land where you couldn't go? Who are you going to take with you? Build an altar of soul winning. Are you anxious for Jesus to come? Would you like for Jesus to return? Would you like for him to come back? Then go win a bunch of people to the Lord because the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So my direction from this passage of Scripture, resolve to build an altar. Build an altar of soul winning. Would you join with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to deliver what you've laid on my heart. And right now, Lord, whether in this room or in rooms wherever, people watching 
digitally. I pray that there would be those that would respond and build an altar of salvation. If you're watching me, listening to me, and you know you need to get saved, do it now. Pray this prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sin. Lord Jesus, I receive you into my life, into my heart. I believe in my heart that you were raised from the dead. And with my mouth, I confess that you are my Lord and Savior. Amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, would you go on our website and just fill out the communication card? Prayed with you, Pastor, and I'll contact you. Lord, I pray your blessing on each one that's here today. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us all to actually build an altar. Not only an altar of salvation, but an altar of service, an altar of stewardship, and an altar of soul winning. In Jesus' name.